Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Maria Ramos. Now, it's been called the modern incarnation of the ancient Silk Road, a trade route by land and sea that connected most of the known world at the time. Now, it's being dubbed the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI for short. Simply put, it's a colossal plan by China to redirect global trade towards the second largest economy. Built as a trillion dollar spending project, it will encompass roads, high speed rails and ports covering nearly two thirds of the world's population and 71 countries. It's absolutely huge. Now, you're probably wondering how it will be financed. Well, a vast majority of those building plans will be financed by Chinese loans and this fact is a prospect that many countries, especially the US, are warning against. They say that the lure of cheap credit is simply a debt trap in disguise. Now, to calm those fears, Chinese President Xi Jinping recently hosted dozens of world leaders in Beijing. He signed $64 billion in BRI-related deals. And she also tried to hammer down that his plan would be about sustainability, transparency and the environment. Right now, the latest agreements push total investment in the Belt and Road Initiative so far to just under $100 billion. And you're probably wondering what's the link to Turkey. Well, Chinese investments and loans are being channeled into Turkey's renewable energy sector, which are expected to soar in the coming years. So are fears of a Chinese debt trap real? And if so, just how vulnerable is Turkey to the prospects of cheap credit to fund grand infrastructure projects? So to discuss this further, I'm joined by Altay Atle, who is a lecturer at Koç uh, University and also partner at Reanda Turkey. And also joining me in the studio is Murat Kolbasha. He's the chairman of the Turkish chapter at Turkey China Business Council. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on Straight Talk. So, Murat, I want to start with you. Yeah. Set the scene for us. Um, how involved is uh, Turkey in the Belt and Road Initiative? And I just want to quote you, actually. You recently said the entry of two Chinese banks in Turkey and the acquisition of a port by a Chinese uh, investors shows China will expand its investments and business operations in Turkey. Sounds very busy. Yes, it seems to be. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, first of all. Of course, China is creating a, one of the, well, I say, wave from east to west. Because after the Second World War, World War we see a lot of uh, wave from coming from west to east. But that time is a little bit different. But actually, when you look to the historical way, you can see the Silk Road. And Turkey is one of the last country for the Silk Road in the Asian continent. So. Today, the, uh, with a new and the modern uh, Silk Road, we call the Belt and Road Initiative, and it is a huge number and huge trade we are talking about. And more than 70 countries involved about that Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, Turkey is quite important for different angles. One of them is logistic-wise, which you mentioned about the port. Of course, also the other one is a trade because. Turkey is one of the hub points for the three continents. So that's why after that two bank uh, acquired from uh, Chinese, actually one of them is created completely new bank. So after that, more than 1,000 Chinese company registered in Turkey and they do some activities in Turkey. They acquire companies, they create new offices, they also invest in Turkey. So the investment of China increasing day by day in Turkey. This is also another option. And of course, Turkey is also another uh, one of the hub for China for manufacturing facilities mm -hmm. because of from east of Germany to the west of China, Turkey is one of the largest and very important man man uh, manufacturing plant or facilities, what we have right now is quite important for the worldwide uh, operation. So that's why Turkish companies and China companies came together and created a good, let's say, result for that. Of course, there is some threat and difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about that. Th there's yeah. also opportunities there. There's also opportunities. Now, let's talk about the threats, the criticism, because yeah. there's been um, a lot mm -hmm. Coming from um, the US, the Vice President Mike Pence has called it debt trap diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Are um, these concerns justified? Yeah, well, uh, 
There's for sure a lot of capital, a lot of finance flowing from China to these countries, to those countries where Chinese companies themselves are undertaking large infrastructure projects. And uh, after, of course, uh, after some point, these loans will have to be paid back with interest, of course. So, uh, but can we call it a debt trap? I'm not sure about that because, well, one thing is, I mean, uh, this money is coming, these loans are coming for a reason. It's, it's based on mutual benefits, actually. The Chinese side is expecting some returns, for sure. But, and other countries who are set to be targeted by this debt trap top diplomacy are actually well doing this because they have certain needs, especially uh, these are countries who are suffering from significant infrastructure gap. So they have to do that. Uh, so, well, can the financing process, can the you know, debt process, can the loan process be more transparent? Probably it can. But is it a debt diplomacy? Uh, is it a debt trap? I'm not so sure about that. If we are talking about a debt, uh, if we are talking about a trap, I think maybe I can say that we should talk about a hypocritical trap here. Really? So, well, simply because uh, the same countries who are criticizing this uh, process, or let's say the, those same governments uh, who are criticizing the process, actually they have uh, more financial, they are higher, more intensive uh, financial relations with China. I mean, if we talk America... Who's criticizing exactly? Because uh, I've well, heard very strong yeah, criticism from yeah, the, the yeah. U.S. You gave the example of the U.S. Uh, it's the same country uh, who's... Uh, who's 1.2 or 3 trillion dollars worth of government bonds are actually owned by Chinese. So, so they are indebted to China uh, as well. Okay. Or we have seen, for example, even Italy was targeted by this mm -hmm. from the rest of the European Union. And it went uh, as far as calling you know, Italy uh, like a Trojan horse inside the European Union because they, are, they have signed a, a memorandum okay. of understanding with China. But uh, again, the same European countries who are doing this critic yeah. is actually they have uh, bigger uh, financial relations with China. So I think it's a, it, this debt trap uh, rhetoric is a, more like a political discourse rather than an economic fact. Okay. And uh, your concerns, um, I'll tell you, about uh, debt trap, um, should Turkey uh, be concerned at all? Of course, we have to be make a right decision for the future. Debt trap is not an exact word also for the economic wise. As a businessman, I don't want to be called like that because for European Union or the other association, including Belt and Road, nobody putting a gun to our head to us to join that. So mm -hmm. if you don't like it, you don't enter then. So that's why you have to be watch make a decision together with the good evaluation and then for your future, for country, for your uh, company, for your even for personal things, you have to be make a right decision after the calculation. This is a very critical issue. Did Sri Lanka make uh, a good decision, uh, a good calculation because its port was was taken over by China because it couldn't uh, repay its debts? And I know this is just one example um, of this scenario? Sri Lanka is one of the cases, but also there is another cases I can bring for mm. the Pakistan. For example, the Gavadar is one of the important uh, area, I mean the port. Also Cairo is also another important port which I have already visited. So the thing is, in the businessman uh, angle, what I say, calculate the issue what come to you mm -hmm. and end of the day if you join what is the benefit for turkey yeah. what is the threat for turkey can we manage if we can manage if we can get a positive uh, result end of today we can join if not we still continue to negotiate because through belt and road turkey is quite an important uh, country because of geographical wise what well, uh, benefits and threats for turkey yeah, benefits and threats. Well, uh, to start with, as I said before, it's the, this project, this initiative is all about mutual interest. So if everybody is winning from this, this project, uh, this initiative will go forward. So, and from the Turkish perspective, so what uh, can we expect from this? I think we are still at the stage of expectations. So it is yet to take off. Well, we have seen, of course, uh, certain projects like there's a Port project. Mm. There are some railway projects, uh, you know, uh, in the pipeline, which are waiting uh, for to be finalized and so on. But what, I think what Turkey can benefit from this this whole thing is. Uh, 
to start with, it's about infrastructure. Turkey has an infrastructure gap as well. For its economic, you know, sustainable economic growth, Turkey needs, uh, well, better, more improved uh, infra logistics infrastructure. And here is an opportunity window for this. All right. Gentlemen, and we'll have to leave this discussion here. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Straight Talk. Uh, Altay uh, Atle and uh, Murat Kolbasha, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Right now, Muslims make up more than 5% of Germany's population. And those Muslims of Turkish descent account for a large number. For decades, German Turks have attended mosques that are affiliated with Turkey's State Directorate for Religious Affairs, known as DITIB. Essentially, it's a Turkish government body that oversees hundreds of mosques in Germany. But now, here's the big issue. There are growing calls to cut links between those mosques in Germany and Turkey. Instead, there would be what some German officials are calling German Islam. Now, already coming off a tense year in Turkish-German relations, it's uncertain what this move could mean for ties between both countries. Omar Kablan went to Germany to find out more. I was born in Berlin and actually I'm 30, 30 years old. My whole life I was here in Berlin and actually I work as a machine engineer. I like a lot of uh, mosques in Berlin, but this one here is my favorite one. It reminds me more in my culture of being a in, in, in Turkish man in Germany. So uh, it will be not forgotten. Sinan is one of four million people of Turkish descent living in Germany. And like most other German Turks, he visits mosques that are affiliated with his ancestral country. But for the German government, that affiliation, which includes sermons conducted in Turkish and imams appointed from Turkey, needs to change. Being home to the largest Turkish diaspora, Germany has also hosted many mosques directly connected to the Turkish government. But if the proposed policies go through, more than 800 mosques will lose their direct links with Turkey. The German parliament is discussing legislation to cut ties, both financial and institutional, between the Turkish Muslim community in Germany and the Turkish government. Part of that plan also includes a campaign to develop a so-called homegrown version of Islam. Ultimately, the changes will put all mosques in the country under the direct control of the German state. Thorsten Frey is an MP and vice head of the Christian Democratic Union in the Bundestag and supports creating a German version of Islam. He's working closely with the Interior Ministry and says such a policy is needed to integrate the country's sizable Muslim minority. In Deutschland, gar nicht. We have about 5% of the population that identifies as Muslim. Almost all Turkish people here do, so it's a large minority. We need to make sure they are integrated into society. That doesn't mean assimilation, but rather integration. And religion can play a big role in that. And it would be good if religion does, in fact, play a positive one. For decades, Turkey has played a role in coordinating the affairs of Germany's Muslim community. It has done this through the Turkish Islamic Union for Religious Affairs, or DITIB, the largest Islamic organization in the country. We are against the phrase German Islam. Islam does not involve a certain ethnic group it encompasses all people, so this is not acceptable. The Turkish Directorate of Religious Affairs is a vital reference point for the Muslim community of Germany, and there really is no way it could be taken out of German society. The German government is discussing to reduce our influence, but we are a source of coexistence and integration in Germany, and the German authorities know this, and I'm sure they will continue to support us. For years, German authorities had regarded DITIB as an important contact point concerning matters of faith and integration and even provided it with state funding. But that perception has now changed. With the influx of more than a million refugees from Syria and Afghanistan since 2014, scrutiny of DITIB has increased among some German officials. It becomes a problem when Turkish authorities are funding imams here because it opens up the possibility that the Turkish state is able to influence people here through the medium of religion. Turkey denies these claims, saying its connections to overseas mosques is about providing religious services and has nothing to do with politics. Recent political tensions between Berlin and Ankara has also seen subsidies for DITIB drastically reduced. 
In 2018, the association received only about $350,000 from the German government, compared to $1.8 million in 2017, and the future doesn't look any brighter. Back at the Turkish mosque in Berlin, Sinan is finishing his daily prayer, hoping that he will be able to continue contributing to the country that he calls home, whilst maintaining his cultural roots. Ahmad Kablan, Straight Talk. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Talib Kuchukjan, who is a, a former Turkish MP and senior fellow at uh, the TRT World Research Centre, who wrote extensively about the Turkish experience in uh, Europe. And also joining me in the studio is uh, Farid Hafez, who is a lecturer at the University of, of Salzburg and specialises in Islamophobia. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here on Straight Talk. Now, um, Farid, I want to start uh, with you and get the German perspective. Why is Germany doing this and why now? Well, I think there is a couple of reasons. Like the larger picture in general is, first of all, that there is something called embassy Islam, right? So until the late 1990s, throughout Europe, not only in Germany, but throughout Europe, every single nation state relied on the Islam politics coming from the sending countries, from Turkey, from Algeria, from Egypt, and so on and so forth. So there was the idea that Muslims won't stay, so th their governments should take care of their citizens in terms of religious affairs. So this is one side. Since 20 years, there has been a shift, which is that the interior, the ministries of interior in countries like Germany, for instance, they have started um, uh, developing projects on how to domesticate Islam in a way. So there is an attempt by European nation states to uh, create what they call a French, a German, an Austrian, a British, whatever kind of Islam. Um, interesting um, point you say, that I, and I want to come back to the idea of um, domesticating Islam that you mentioned. Um, Talib, to you, how has Turkey reacted to this and what can it practically do? Because these mosques, 900 of them, are in Germany. Well, actually, the Turks have started going to Germany since the 1960s. And since then, of course, they went there with their culture, with their religion, and they wanted to reproduce their Islamic culture and heritage over there. When they started establishing mosques, they approached the German government, they approached many uh, organizations there, but their religious needs were not satisfied and met by the receiving country. And then they turned back to Turkey and upon their actual request, Turkey started sending imams over there. So that was a necessity, and I think it was also the right of this Muslim minority in Germany, because uh, you know, practicing your religion and also teaching your religion to your kids is a fundamental, I think, basic human right. And I think that's what has been practiced. And uh, Turkey has invested a lot, not because Turkey would like to influence people outside, but it was the request and demand by the Turkish diaspora, both in Europe and elsewhere. And now we are talking about a great number of uh, mosques. Who will be replaced, those imams? Mm -hmm. Who will be replaced, think, the um, uh, religious teachers and, and preachers? I think uh, Germany is playing a very dangerous game. Uh, and trying to securitize Islam and Muslims. Now today, Islam and Muslims are part of German society, and most of those people, the Turkish community, the members of the congregation, actually they were born and brought up in Germany. They speak German much better than Turkish. But also they would like to keep their religious identity intact, but in cooperation with the, with the German society. And it seems that the German government is uh, thinking that the Islam is an uh, obstacle to integration. It is not, in my mind. If you allow people to practice their religion, it is not an obstacle yeah. to integration, actually. What is obstacle to okay. the integration is racism, discrimination, mm -hmm. and not having a clear and sustainable policy towards immigration. OK, I, I want to come to that later. Um, but back to you, uh, Farid. Um, as you've said, you've said, you've called this actually, uh, Germany is playing a dangerous game. What has been the reaction from uh, the German, uh, t the Turkish community in Germany? Uh Turkish community in Germany, yes. Well, I think since a long time, I think the whole problem of what you, you just called the, the securitization of Islam has been there. 
and people feel it, right? They feel it on the ground. I mean, in Germany, you have this idea of uh, def defending democracy. Uh, that's it's it's quite a, it's kind of a state principle. So the Ministry of Interior, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution, which is kind of the secret service of the of the German uh, Ministry of Interior, it publishes an annual report. So part of it is, uh, for instance, to say like the Islamic community of Miligurdish, which is one of the largest, strongest uh, communities after the DITIB, uh, they have been uh, observed by these institutions. So obviously, many of these institutions they see themselves as being. Uh, marginalized as being criminalized and that has not a, a, a very positive effect. I think really the, at the, the larger picture is uh, also from a structural perspective there is a problem because secularism normally means that religions don't interfere into politics but also it means that states do not interfere into religions. Mm -hmm. So what we see is for instance when how the Catholic, the Protestant churches and the, the Jewish communities are dealt with, there is a ministry of cultural affairs that deals with them. But when, when it comes to Muslims it's the ministry of interior that deals with them and I think that all already speaks volumes about like how we can yeah. make sense of this relationship at the moment. And I just want to look at the rhetoric a bit because um, a top civil servant in the German Interior Ministry, Markus Kerber, he gave um, an interview uh, recently and he said, what we need now is an Islam for German Muslims that belongs to Germany. That does not mean that we have to develop a new theology. It means that German Muslims have to decide what kind of Islam do we want here? Um, what do you make um, of these comments? And I'll ask that to, uh, to you, Talib. Well, I think the government intervention in religious affairs will backfire. I think there's a similar attempt in France these days, for example, they have prepared a report to create a French style of Islam. In my view, Islam cannot be ethnicized. Islam cannot be nationalized in that sense. And you cannot really expect people to cut off their roots because we are living in an age of globalization, first of all. Secondly, we see the emergence of transnational communities. And you cannot really uh, make a clear distinctions between the two. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, Germany, uh, when you look at the Turkish, uh, I think, uh, community, uh, they are uh, well integrated into society. Yeah. When you lo look, at, look at the crime rates, when, when you look at the radicalization, when you look at the extremism, you will find hardly anyone within the Turkish community. And I think that is uh, because of the uh, mosques, that is because of the Islamic inculcation, that okay. is because of their perception of Islam. If you try to, I think, uh, isolate Turks or other uh, Muslim minorities from their uh, roots, uh, that will not be in the interest of uh, both sides. And as, as uh, Fariz says, uh, uh, they are living in Germany, it's a secular society, and the government intervention in religion is not acceptable in any uh, secular state. And a few, days, a few years ago, actually, the German government has decided to establish German Islam Conference. Okay. And some groups are excluded from that conference. And lately, uh, Germany has established five different faculty of Islamic studies where they can teach uh, okay. people of uh, uh, Muslim origin, then the uh, graduates will be teaching at the universities or becoming imams, but that will take a long time. And now we have got a working relations, and, and uh, remember that 800 imams were uh, sent from Turkey uh, in agreement with the German government. And what okay. happened all of a sudden that the German government is now uh, trying to change uh, its mind? Good point. And um, I want your reaction, uh, Farid, to the rhetoric that I uh, commented on that we're hearing from the German ministry. All right. Well, first of all, I think um, Muslims in many Western countries feel at home, right? So they don't need governments to tell them they can be at home. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, really, I mean, what we see when there is a rhetoric and then there is a policy and often they don't match each other. Um, because if the state would be really secular in the sense of leaving religion to establish their own things, uh, leave them on their own, Nobody, I think, would, be, would have a problem. But I think really it's about an interference into what notion of Islam should be developed. And let's take the example of, this, uh, uh, of uh, institutionalizing Islamic theology at state universities. We clearly see that, for instance, the, uh, um, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution um, is having an impact in how uh, the structures of these institutions are developed. So it's, you, you cannot really say, if you look at the facts, that uh, Muslim people are free to develop the way they want to do. 
but there is an attempt by the state to what I refer to, to domesticate Islam. And I think that's, it's not really about the issue of having a German Islam or not a German Islam. It's really about like, what is the implication on behalf of the state? And what does it mean on behalf of Muslims if they say, we wanna, we wanna be like German Muslims? So I think that's two different stories, even though they're using, using the same ways of, of, of naming it. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed uh, for your thoughts uh, in this discussion. Talib Kuchukjan, thank you. And uh, Farid Hafiz, thanks so much for thank flying you. in uh, and being with us here at TRT World Straight Talk. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Maria Ramos. If you've got any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.